I will call the meeting to order, and since Lisa is not here, I will do the roll call. Um, I am here. Ashana Squaga. Here. Scott Bailey has been excused. Chris Bender. Here. Amarsa Brown. Here. Mike Kazmierski. I believe he's on his way. He's on his way. Newt. Nancy McCormick. Present. Uh, Susan Schilling. Here. John Thurman. Here. Bradley Woodring. Uh, Gracie Tout. Here. Uh, Cheryl Cadoza. Here. David Turner. Here. Cheryl Wharf. Here. Thank you. And we have we have quorum. And so we will continue. Um, first, I'd like to welcome um, all of you who are here, but especially um, Regent Carol Del Carlo is here with us. And, and another guest, uh, John Madole, who is the former executive director of the Associated General Contractors, Yay. has come to visit us. Thank you, and thank you, everyone else, our fan club. <laughs> um, item number, agenda item two, public comment. Uh, public comment will be taken during this agenda item. No action may be taken on a matter raised under this item until the matter is included in agenda as an item on which action may be taken. Comments will be limited to two minutes per person. Persons making comment will be asked to begin by stating their name for the record and to spell their last name. The council chair may elect to allow additional public comment on a specific agenda item when that agenda item is being considered. Do we have any public comment at this time? Seeing none, we will move on uh, to agenda item number three, approval of the minutes. Unfortunately, the minutes did not get distributed uh, for this uh, to be here today, uh, so we will move that and do that at our next meeting. And then we will move to agenda item number four, a uh, presentation by David Turner, the Student Government Association President, on the proposed fitness complex and soccer field. David. Yay. Good morning, everybody. I'm sure some of you have heard, caught wind that we are looking at the possibility of bringing in an athletic facility to TMCC to make it a more holistic campus for all students. So two of our big things with it is campus engagement and creating pride on campus. These are two big things to help make TMCC a sticky campus. This will help keep students here on campus and engaged. Instead of leaving campus to go somewhere else, if we have an athletic facility, like to maybe to a gym, they may stay on campus and decide to run around the track. Um, clubs would be able to use it for any kind of club events. This would also create a place where, if need be, we could have our graduation at because we have a beautiful campus and we don't have a way of actually showcasing it in any of our events like the way that a, uh, an athletic facility would be able to do. So the location of the athletic facility would actually just be down the hill on uh, Dandini a little bit, right on the other side of uh, Regario Way. It would have, we're talking about different possibilities for entrances and exits to this. However, it would be an ideal location down there. The only thing that we would really have to work at is leveling out the land, but it would be close enough to the campus. It would definitely prepare TMCC for the future and increase in enrollment with students. More students would be looking at us to be able to come here for their education instead of California, Oregon, or Idaho. You can go to the next one. But the big question is the cost and funding. <laughs> so that is the number that we are looking at, and that is the worst case scenario that we could come up with. But you're missing the zero, I just Oh, I have to see the zero. <laughs> yeah. 22 million. <laughs> 22 million, yeah. Two, two million yeah. would be great. <laughs> So these are the possibilities of looking for funding. We could, um, our guaranteed revenue that we would, uh, are proposing is a $9 per credit student fee. It does seem like a really big number, especially since we are a community college. However, if you break it down to a 15 credit semester, UNR is $3,600 per semester for a 15 credit load. TMCC would be just under $1,600 for a 15 credit load per semester that would still fit right in with the Pell Grant covering the entire semester for the year for every student. If you're taking a full credit load, you're getting about 5,600 on a Pell Grant. This would cover it. 
this is what we would be looking at uh, on average per year with what we're currently enrolling per student. That's uh, 178,000 credits per year is what we look at. And that would be our annual revenue just from the uh, $9 per credit fee. Um, so the facilities for the students, it's for the institution, and it's for the community. This would create engagement not just with our students, but with the Reno Sparks area. We'd be looking at partnering, uh, creating new partnerships, like with the uh, minor soccer league that's coming up here to Reno, children's camps, getting them familiar with TMCC before they're even thinking about college, but no, now this is the college that they may want to go to. It, it just creating a different kind of engagement with everybody. We will become like a, almost like an educational hub. So with our student impact, you know, this is, it's not just about athletic students. With a lot, a lot of people think about an athletic facility, well, this is only gonna benefit the athletic students. We wanna make sure that that is not the case. So all the profits that would be raised from this athletic facility, from like renting it out to the minor soccer league to use for practice, for children's camps, all those proceeds would end up coming back to the SGA. What we are currently working on and proposing with our constitution, which will go up for change um, in April when the students vote in our election for student government is to adopt this new change to our constitution that would make it so a minimum of 80% of all profits SGA receives outside of student fees and donations will go back into endowments and scholarships for every student. So we can make sure that if a student cannot afford with the, to come to school because of this $9 credit fee, we have a way of making sure that they can still come to college. And we're looking at anywhere between 100 to 500 new scholarships being, being able to be created just off of profits from this kind of facility. Are there any questions regarding the athletic facility? This isn't a question, this is a couple of comments. Just uh, the, the bid is, pro is the worst case scenario. And to give you a context of how that occurred, at the time, we, we thought we would be bringing this to the Regents in December. And so H&K Architects were working on two proposals for us. They had about a month to scope out the Eats building and a, the soccer field. So uh, they really didn't have a lot of time to get a, a, an extremely cautious cost estimate. So Jim New and I asked them to, to provide the worst case scenario. Since that time, we've been talking to a, a couple of other uh, individuals whose expertise is actually sports fields. And we're really hopeful that that 22 million will be significantly reduced. Now, the way the regents work, the, and, and Carol will learn this soon, that our, our goal is uh, the students will be asking for permission for the $9 fee at the upcoming March meeting. If in the month of June or July, and, and and hopefully that'll be a yes, that'll trigger the, the a real architectural uh, RFP. Uh, not, not that H&K isn't real, but they, they are real, they're wonderful. But they didn't have a lot of time. I think probably by the month of July, you know, maybe uh, August at the latest, we'll have a really realistic cost. And if that cost is lower and if we can reduce the fee, the administration is committed to going back to the regents <coughs> with the students to lower that fee accordingly. And so, and I think that's a really important point. In the first bid, the cost is projected, and this is where we're hearing a lot of um, other builders saying that is, well, I'm, I'm interested in what you think, John, I truly am. They're saying it's $8 million just to level the, the area, even though half of the area is leveled already. And so, so that part is pretty debatable, and, and I think we just need to, to learn more. Had we had known that later we, we would be advised to wait until March, which we really didn't know until a couple of weeks before the December meeting, we probably would have gone about it differently and tried to get a much uh, tighter cost estimate from, from the get-go. So, so that's the one thing that I wanted to add. And uh, well, the second thing is we had a really great meeting with, with the ACES baseball folks who are doing a minor soccer league 
they're very excited about this and they do want to partner with us to hopefully use the field for some of their practices. They've also suggested that some of their coaches, minor league coaches, might be interested in helping us with, with some of the coaching. So that was pretty fun. Some of the players might want to help with the coaching. And so uh, there's definitely some synergy building as more and more people in the community find out about this. I do think that the student plan to put revenues back into scholarships is fantastic. And, and I'm, I'm just so, I'm so proud of this particular group of SGA leaders. They're, they've really uh, done a great job. So thank you. Anyway. Thank you. Cheryl. So I just want to bring up some concerns, and David's aware of these concerns, and he's trying to address them, which I really appreciate. But the faculty are concerned about a $9 credit hour fee because some of our students are barely affording what our fees are now. And if they can't afford this with the $9, it can cause a lot of problems. It'll take a while before that revenue starts kicking in, and they can give the scholarships to students. In the survey SGA took, there were a couple comments by students that said things like, um, people who want to play sports should be paying the extra fee. And one student who said, um, if you do this, I won't be able to attend TMCC. So I'm concerned about that. The faculty are concerned about that. We've addressed it with David, and he is trying his darndest to do something about it. And I thought this was a great presentation, David. But I wanted the IAC to be clear, too, that the faculty have serious concerns about this proposal. Um, and to address uh, Cheryl's concerns, one of the things that we are looking that we can do right now is we did, we are getting a fee increase that's part of the actual tuition. So the students aren't paying more per credit. We're just getting a bigger piece of that pie now. We are creating more scholarships and emergency student funds. So let's, if a student cannot afford to come to school because of that, we can offset the cost with this emergency uh, student scholarship fund. And we are working with the foundation and trying to create more scholarships with our, our new fee that we are getting. So it tripled what we're getting. So now we're creating more events, but we're also creating more things for students. So if they cannot come to school or cannot afford the cost of their books, they can come to us and we can make sure through our emergency student scholarship that they can still come here or get their books or even get food. Because we do partner up with the uh, Wizards Warehouse, which is our food bank on campus. You know, I might have missed this, but what is the cost per credit hour now? It's about $92 a credit okay. hour. So you're going it's, up It's 91 and some change, is that correct? I want to say it's... It's 91.50. 91.50. It's a 10% increase. Yeah. And unless you're talking about out-of-state non-residents, then it's like 127.90 or something. Mm -hmm. Has there yeah. been any conversation about other, um, going after other money and not Definitely. putting it entirely on the... Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's part of the plan. This is and it and just like with the East <coughs> building, it's hard to start doing that officially until the regions have said yes, go mm -hmm. forward. But definitely, this is uh, mainly like our guaranteed source of income. We and Dr. Hilgerson and I have talked about this, and we are looking to see about sponsorships and donations, similar that we've done to the other campuses, about being able to help offset this cost. Regents want what is your guaranteed source of income? And this is our guaranteed source of revenue for this, but this is not the only one that we are gonna to try to rely on. The other thing, David and the student government, they did do a survey which was probably one of the, in the history of the college, had more respondents than any other survey. And, and that's the one thing that I, I think we ought to add to the presentation is some of the results of that survey. Now, as any survey which involves close to 1,000 students, some of the students are not in favor of this, but the majority of students were in favor of the field, and the majority of students were in favor of a $5 per credit, and then there were about, I want to say 20% who were willing to pay more, 9 to 12. But, I, but now I need to have the survey in front of me. So, right. so the students really did, in my opinion, attempt to get a cross-section of students' response, responses, but in the end, SGA are the elected officials. They're like the Congress for the Student Government Association. And so they are taking a leap of faith that, that this will be good for their constituents in the short term and the long term. And I think that's really key. Uh, from, from my standpoint, one of the things I like about it is I do think it will help us recruit students. I think it will help us build enrollment. I think it will help people realize where Dandini is because they will have come to our campus up here on the hill to see a soccer game or to you know, to have their, their kids play a soccer game, you know, so, so I think there's a lot of other benefits to it from the standpoint of just purely 
uh, making a, a campus that's more student in, engaging. And I think David brings that out in his presentation quite nicely. Of course, you're always going to have some students who, you know, they are barely getting to school now. But I do think those are relatively few in number at TMCC. I just came from a college where 91% of our students were qualifying for state and federal aid. They were extremely poor. Here that number is around 50%. 50? 50. 50. <clears throat> so. Um, I have a, qu a question I'd like to ask because I know NFA is also concerned about this. I see the big picture and I see where you're going and I, and, um, I think there's some really great ideas in that. The concern is, is this $9 fee going to be continual? Or if it's, let's say, $8 or $7, depending on how much money you raise, for the rest of the life of TMCC students? Or is this just until that facility is built? It just until the facility is built and paid off and then it sunsets. Okay. And that's yes. being written in that okay. the fee will sunset. Okay. Yep. And then the second question is, I mean, there's a lot of rumors circulating within faculty about this. And so the other question is, once the facility is built, for two things. One is that students will have to pay to belong to the facility. And one is that they won't. So what's the? No. <laughs> students will not have to pay to okay, use it. Good. It will be like. Uh, any club can rent out space here and facilities sets it up for them to be able to utilize for the club space or even students can do that themselves. The same will be uh, for the athletic facility. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. no, students are paying for I have no idea where that this. rumor has come yeah. from. Yeah, since they're paying a fee, yeah. you wouldn't think they'd have to pay an additional fee. No. no. That's what I thought, but I thought I better ask. There might be some team fees, but that, that would have to do with any kind of intramural teams or something, that, and that's, that's common, and that has to do with uniforms, et yeah, cetera. Just, the yeah. only thing that may have a, a fee, and there's no guarantee that it's going to happen, is if we get a velodrome, which is an indoor bicycle racing track. Mm -hmm. yes. That would have a fee, but that's for like community members because you know a three-month season pass for a velodrome is $250. Mm -hmm. And typically, the velodromes around us are sold out for season passes. And the closest one's four hours from us, and a big chunk of their population there is from Reno. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we've looked at because all of the sports that we've looked at and that we're proposing typically run green or yellow, which means they either make money or they run neutral. We didn't look at any sports that run red. We don't want it costing any more than what it's looking to cost. Thank you. Any, any other questions from, oh. John. Well, just, just a quick question, and I, I know there's all kinds of hurdles to overcome, but let's just say all the hurdles are able to be set aside. What's the timeline and the processes that, what's the, the chronological order from this point to completion? Do you want some help with that? <laughs> well, from what I, I understand, it, yeah. um, a year is what we're looking for the soccer field and the track around the soccer field. And then about five years for the actual facility that will be next to the, the soccer field. That would house all our PEX classes, um, possibility mm -hmm. of basketball, wrestling, um, volleyball or even the velodrome inside of it. Okay. All right. Although I did talk to one contractor who feels that, that you could even do that for less money all at once. So we really need to go back and hire um, an expert in fields and field houses or, you know, uh, the, again, the big thing is just getting the land ready, you know through explosives. So how fast can you get your, right, <laughs> your detonator yeah. out there? Yeah. <laughs> It's just one sort of simple question. Who's going to mow the lawn? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, can I answer this? So I think what, what the administration has committed to is that we would be uh, tasked with hiring additional staff to mow the lawn to basically maintain the, the building. That, that I, I don't think that's something that should be on the backs of students. The other thing that we're going to have to do uh, with men's and women's soccer is we are going to need to hire at least one dedicated uh, director who ideally can, uh, uh, it'd be great if that person could also do the coaching too. So right now what we're looking at, in my opinion, we're looking at about 1.5 positions connected to this project. So. Okay. Oh, Mike. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> um, thanks for all the hard work on it. Adding making the, uh, the college here more attractive to students is certainly a plus. So I see that as a positive, uh, adding value. I just happen to think a 10% increase seems like a, a big jump for students 
it's, you know, when the survey said $5, and so that part is a challenge. You, you may not have to go to nine, because I believe there are plenty of contractors in this community that would do things at cost or do things even donating services during off, off peak, off season that would help keep that cost down so maybe you don't have to go all the way to $9. So, um, you know, in the RFP, I would, you know, really look at who are the people in the community that step up and do things like this and talk to them offline because once you get into the public process, it becomes kind of annoying. Mm -hmm. um, I'll leave it at that <laughs> and see who will really jump in there and make a difference for us in a, in a support, a voluntary or a, a, you know, some kind of break on the cost of doing things. Yes. Anyone else? Because I know David has to go to class. <laughs> He's, he is a student. <laughs> and I'm actually yes. going to uh, my core humanities class with uh, Joe Dimitrovic, and he has expressed interest and said that he would definitely step up to coach track and field and cross country. Indeed. All right. Great. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you, David, very much. That was excellent, and congratulations to the students yes. for putting this all together, and uh, we certainly look forward to uh, following how this all moves along. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. You guys have a good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, agenda item five, uh, the President's update. Okay. So first of all, I just want to thank you uh, for those who were able to attend the inauguration, and even those who weren't unable to attend, but send me a lot of, uh, sent to me a lot of kind, generous words. I really appreciate it. And um, it was really a special day for me and my family. And I'm so happy to be at TMCC, and my entire family is happy to be at TMCC. So uh, thank you for that. And we are trying to find more of these because for those of you who couldn't attend, these were the kind of the little party favors and, and they're actual seeds that you can really plant. They're very cool. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, I have uh, what I would consider four important updates. Time me, Kali. Okay. 10 minutes or less so that you can have time for questions. Okay. First thing is, uh, and I, many of you might not be aware of this. I, I wasn't when I took the job. But the way the performance-based funding model works, that every couple of years there's a snapshot of, an, of, of your per credit student hour completion. And that snapshot for this next round of funding is occurring fall term of 2017. So it is very important that in fall of 2017, 17, we have really great enrollment numbers. Uh, right now, our spring enrollment numbers are down, so we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Luckily, one of the things that this campus has been engaging in are many conversations about marketing and rebranding. And now we're to the point where we're, uh, Elena Bobnova and I, and Elena is serving in the interim marketing director capacity and working very closely with Kate. It, we, we've been starting to take some of the ideas that have been given to us internally and externally and shopping them around with professionals. Um, not that we're not professional, we are, but outside professionals who've got a lot of, uh, <coughs> they devote their time and their energies to helping organizations brand and, and market. Uh, I think the brand that is emerging for Truckee Meadows Community College is a brand that really identifies itself with, with an urban core. And when I think about this brand, I think about, not that we want to do this to our facilities, but I think about the, the remodel of the post office in downtown Reno. Have, been, have you been down to the basement with Chomp and the, you know, it's kind of that hip, edgy, risky, urban core. And Sparks is also growing similar to Reno, you know, so it's not just the Reno urban core, it's the Reno Sparks and the whole Truckee Meadows area. So the brand is, is sort of dependent on this idea that uh, what urban centers do pretty well is they attract innovators. They attract people who are at the cutting edge of developing new economies and new ideas. And I think that's true of TMCC faculty and staff, that our faculty and staff are highly innovative. And, and I used probably too many examples in my speech the other day, but there were so many to share of some of the wonderful things happening here. So I, I kind of wanted to give you that update so you could think about it, that to have a brand that says, we're not a small rural college anymore. 
We're not like WNC. That's their brand, and they're proud of it, and they do a really great job with that particular population. And they and they're like a they're like a good sister to me. You know, I really love. I really enjoy working with Chet Burton and WNC. They're doing a great job. But our brand is different. Our brand is urban. It's cutting edge. It's it's not just cutting edge, but edgy. And, and to try to have a marketing campaign that's rolled out very soon in time for fall enrollment numbers to try to use that brand to capture the, the students that we're looking for for that fall snapshot. There is a name suggestion that some of you might not like, and if you don't like it, let <coughs> me know. Because, um, and I think at this point, at some point we're just gonna have to turn the name discussion over to the students the reason I like it is because I'm very frugal and it would cost very little to implement. And it would be Truckee Meadows City College with the community tagline attached. Um, like I said, I'm just, don't confuse the name idea with the brand idea, even though it's relevant, it's not at the heart of it. Uh, but, you, but you do need to know that there are individuals concerned that we offer now two bachelor's degrees, including the degree in logistics and operations management, and there, there's a concern that it's hard to market that. It's not impossible to market that, but it's hard to market that when people think of us as strictly a two-year college. Okay, um, I'm really not in favor of, of dropping the community or, the, or this, the second C because we would have to change logos, business cards. I mean, it, it really is an expense, uh, and by making a small change, the, the, we would probably still be referred to as TMCC. People aren't going to say Truckee Meadows City College, just like they don't say Truckee Meadows Community College very much now. But it is an idea, but I do want to know your thoughts. So if, if you don't have strong feelings about it, please don't respond to me. If you do have a strong feeling about it, either way, let me know. Let me know. Uh, because at some point, I, I want the discussion of the name to just be done. And, and But to be able to know how to deal with whatever happens, whether it's from the perspective of how do we market bachelor's degrees on the one hand, or uh, how do we uh, market a, a new name on the other hand. So I do have strong feelings about having a, a brand that's really um, capturing the new Reno Sparks attitude, but I don't have strong feelings about the name, so it's just one suggestion. Okay. The other thing, partner work that's in, happening. We are, uh, thanks to Estella's team and Barbara's team, there's some good work happening right now with UNR around transfer. And um, that work is um, going through probably over 100 degree programs, identifying trouble spots, working with UNR people to fix those trouble spots. I think it's really great work, and I just wanted to mention that to you. And we do need to get someone from UNR on the IAC, but it's been, oh God, the timing, the yeah. time has just been difficult. It's going by very quickly. I also wanted to mention I had a really good meeting with the president of Western Governors University with NSHE, entered into a formal partnership with them about a year ago. I think there's some options there, but we're just starting to talk about it. The most exciting partnership, though, is actually private-public. Uh, we're having very significant conversations with Sierra Nevada College about having a Sierra Nevada College University Center right here at TMCC for students who want to do the private educational route in three programs, education, business, and hospitality. So I wanted to let you know about that. The Chancellor search is, is almost underway. It's the NC Vice Chancellor, Vice Chancellor for Community Colleges. It's launching sometime this month. There will be a, a process that I have before me that, and part of that process does include an interview with TMCC IAC chair and, and myself for the finalists. So I wanted to let you know about that. And then legislation. In a moment, you'll hear from Kyle Dalpy on what's going on in the legislature, legislation, le ah, legislative <laughs> session and how you can help. Today at 3.30, there's a hearing on dual credit, which I actually thought it was Monday, but learned that it w it's actually happening today. And hopefully Kyle found out a little bit more about that and he can share that with you. Uh, th really, the job is pretty simple. Support the governor's budget. For us, that's 1.8 million year one for, for CTE fundings in four targeted areas, three of which we currently uh, have. 
2.5 million in year two, and we're told that that's being a permanently added to the base, which is fantastic. One million is slated for us for caseload management growth, and again, that was based on a snapshot taken a while ago. And then another one million, which begins in year two for capacity building and building new programs, which is pretty exciting. So it, it's a really good budget for us. Uh, we also were allocated a 2% and 2% each year of the biennium COLA for all of uh, faculty and staff. Um, what, we ha what we didn't get was the merit pay request. And, and that's a long story, we don't have time today, but uh, I think we're gonna need to try to find ways to fund faculty salaries locally. Because I just don't see, it's certainly not, I don't think it's gonna change this biennium and it's gonna be a long way to get back to a longevity step uh, progression that used to exist in NG, but that no longer exists. So, okay. Questions? Oh, questions. I don't know, I should have put my stopwatch on. Um, I, I have a question, I do have a question. Um, on the marketing, um, it was brought up sometime earlier that we were going to use TMCC funds to yes. start outreach so basically in support of getting students get the pipeline right. going because that's something that we've been focusing on because we can build all these you know encourage all these right. wonderful programs we can connect them to employers but if we don't have people coming in to get into those there's actually three buckets of funding that are uh, we expect and it's too early to announce this but we do have we're working with the private foundation who has offered to help us fund targeted marketing, especially when it comes to the um, uh, uh, programs out at the Applied Technology Center. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that. We also have reserves, pretty ample reserves, that, that are perfect for this purpose, that we're going to dedicate toward marketing. But you know, our marketing budget is not what it needs to be at all. And so we're gonna, you're gonna see significant increases in that just f from now in perpetuity. We just have to do a better job budgeting for that. The competition is too fierce right now. So, um, and then the, the other thing that's happening is Frank Woodbeck has been working with me and finding some uh, inexpensive ways with help from Dieter to help us market. And we've all, Frank and I have also been talking to Enshi about doing a community college statewide com marketing campaign. That's going a little slower. It's something I need to talk with uh, our, all of our regents about. Yeah, yeah. But, but the conversation has, has begun because I, and there are some systems that have done this. California is an example where the California Community College system has put out television ads about community colleges. So we're, we're trying to attack marketing from several different angles, drilling down to the, and I've had talks with Superintendent Davis about this. How do we get some of this information to your, to your kids, right? How do we do that? So, very specific marketing to, to very general broad marketing and actually um it, i can't remember i think it was one of the community college um, meetings of, with the regents with their committee that it was actually brought up by one of the regents that perhaps that we were discussing this problem and it was brought up by a regent shouldn't we give them some extra money for marketing yeah. so uh we were all very thrilled when we heard that right. yeah um, so uh questions mike what is the what is the current relationship with the school district? We have sixty four thousand potential yeah. students phased in over four years that are all, you know, in many cases clueless to the community college system. So I I I can tell you that in the last six weeks, I think I've had a total of five meetings, four to five meetings with Superintendent Davis. Uh, and part of what's been helpful at establishing a relationship and finally having more frequent meetings, and I got to give uh, Frank Woodbeck a lot of credit for that. Uh, and, and, and that goes uh, back to a relationship that Frank Woodbeck has, and, and he's serving as our interim vice chancellor right now with the superintendent of Washoe County School District. They kind of go way back, and, and that's been very helpful. So I think we're making progress. It's not as fast as I would like to be really blunt, uh, but but we're we're trying. We're trying. Yeah, my concern is the superintendents here and the students are here. Yeah. And you can mm -hmm. have the greatest relationship with the superintendent. Right. The students don't get it. 
So let me answer it a different way. And, and Estella can, uh, oh, I know she, she had to get some work done. I, she probably, did she just leave? Yeah, she asked me if she, she needed to leave a little earlier today. Uh, there is actually a lot going on where TMCC has a presence at almost all the high schools. And the reason I know this is I was asked by uh, some high level officials, well, what, what are you doing to expose TMCC to our students? And we produced a very long list of, we visit the schools, the schools come here. I mean, the, and I can provide that list to you, but, but we are actually doing as much as we possibly can with our, I think a total of two recruiters, two or three, you know, who are really devoted to this one thing. Uh, so we really, we're really to the point where we, we need help. We need help from the, from management in Washoe County School District. Uh, and, and not that we're not getting any help, we are getting some help, but there's just so much more that we can be doing. I was, I was thinking, you know, I think back to when I was in school, of course it's different now, but right. uh, less than 15% of our high school graduates are gonna get a four year degree. So we've got so many opportunities there. Right. It's almost like if we can't get the school district to have a, every high school maybe a different day, a community college day, where it's almost like a job fair. Right. And not only are you selling a community college, but you're selling the pathway to a job. Yes. And so it's a different sales pitch, it's a different marketing. It's, you know, hit one school at a time and put a lot of resources there and just methodically go through that process every year. So now you're talking to a student and saying, you know, hey, you know, have you thought about this, this, and this? And here is the pathway there. Right. And I, and I, I did make a suggestion in one of the meetings because I've seen this at another college where, where I, you know, in Spokane, where, uh, where I grew up for 23 years. And, and that is we, we had buses, busloads of high school kids and, and pretty young high school kids. I, if I recall, it was like uh, between, uh, well, and middle school too, eighth and ninth graders. We, we took like three days a year and they would, all these buses would show up on campus and we had faculty ready to give tours and talk about programs. We'd give a free lunch and you know, I mean, it was a big deal. And the school district helped pay for the transportation and the release time uh, for some of the, because I think it, it led to some re release time cost. And I'm not, I don't recall how that worked. I have made that suggestion and so I, and, and, it, and it certainly is, I think it's being, you know, there's a lot of suggestions on the table. So it, I, I'm definitely not getting an outright no, 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 which is great. I mean, that means that we can get to yes. <laughs> so yeah. we'll just keep working at it. But I, I just think there's so many things that we can do and like so, so many great ideas. Just that one we're more not point doing. before Michonne jumps in. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the superintendent and the staff are so focused in some cases on their day-to-day -day stuff that it may be time that this council engage with the school board. And we all have relationships with board members. If we could lay out a clear plan to do that, I think you can count on our um, involvement in one-on-ones with, with school board members so that not only are you working through the system, but we're working through the leadership piece. And that would just be a, a thought. I think that's it. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, sorry. Michonne. <laughs> I think uh, Mike saw me <laughs> itching over here. No, I, you know, I, uh, I think it is the million dollar question, figuring out how to reach these high school kids and frankly, middle school as well. And, uh, you know, I do think, um, it is, um, I mean, we need to have the green light from the management at the district, but I don't know if there's a way to start with just getting <coughs> school counselors up here to where they can understand what programs are offered, not only school counselors at high schools, but middle schools as well. You're looking at a smaller number, um, because I think, and I, again, I'm talking a little out of school, but I, I don't know that there's a real workforce yeah. focus with a lot of the school counselors, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, if we can at least get a green light <coughs> to where we can start going in between mm -hmm. to try to um, develop some programs to communicate with those kids. And I'm just going to throw another kind of right field thing out here because I think this is a really grassroots 
type of marketing, almost guerrilla marketing, how you approach some of these neighborhoods and kids. But, you know, going maybe also, not giving up on the district, mind you, but having a strategy to go maybe with the Boys and Girls Club. They've got 20 locations around the valley. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of kids going through That's there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, frankly, they're, they're pretty proactive. Um, and there may be, there might be a strategy there um, to get kids thinking about the community college and programs at the Applied Technology mm -hmm. Center. Um, they are over here in Sun Valley, they're on Neal Road, they're, um, they're all over. So just a thought. I love that idea. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Chris? <laughs> just something. What level does the school function at from the standpoint of capacity? I mean, are we like a 50% capacity or 80 or what's that number? So because, so when you think about it, we have 168 full-time faculty and then we have, depending on the term, we have several hundred part-time faculty. So we are able to sort of uh, uh, shrink and grow and unfortunately, because we can very quickly non-renew part-time faculty for a semester. So that's how we kind of manage the, some of the costs. So the short answer is we do have capacity uh, and we can grow capacity by adding both full-time and part-time positions. Uh, I, I would, you know, and I, Barbara might answer this better, I, I'd say that since enrollment's down about 8% this term, my guess would be that we're probably operating at about 80% capacity now. But, it, but it's pretty easy for us to expand and to contract because of the large numbers of part-time faculty. And by the way, I see that with, I say that not in a, I think it's unfortunate that higher ed depends so much on part-time faculty. I wish we didn't, but that started in the 70s in this country and it certainly hasn't gone, it, it hasn't got back, you know. But, but one of the positives of that is it helps us manage capacity. Okay, one other little minor thing. On the uh, counselors and the, you know, the marketing direction, um, this, I see the high school, my experiences of being a high school ski coach, which obviously are not that great of a deal, but the conversations that you have in the bus going up to the ski hill have a tendency to be very intuitive learning opportunities. And they are very willing to talk about jobs and what they're doing and where they're going. But my work at Sky Tavern, which then drops down into the elementary level, I don't talk to the kids about that, but I talk to their parents about it. It's more of that, I think, at the, at the lower levels. It's a parental push, not a kid push. Because mm -hmm. they don't, at that point, they have no clue. But their parents might. And they and love the rotary notebooks that John's Club gives them. Yeah. So I do think that there's, you know, a, a marketing mentality that needs to be directed at parents at the lower levels mm -hmm. and can go directly at the kids at the upper level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm afraid we're... Oh, very quickly. Well, then i got to choose. <laughs> well, well you have another opportunity in just a minute. <coughs> uh, okay, well, at first, the question I have is you said that enrollments were down. Is to Have you identified the population that is that down in? Is that down in high school age uh, individuals or is that in the more adult population? Elena, do you want to take that? It's probably a little of both, but she has the precise numbers that are coming in. Uh, Elena Bobnova, for the record. Um, we do have an enrollment drop that we're seeing kind of across the board. One of the things that is a bit of an uphill battle for us is that we are, our, our immediate service area is pretty much at a full employment right now. And so when employment goes down, um, enrollment tends to uh, go down correspondingly because um, uh, a significant portion of our student population are adults. Adults who are either coming back for retraining or uh, an up training to uh, um, get moved up in their jobs. And all of those trends are now running kind of counter cyclical to enrollment. So we, uh, that's one big challenge that we are faced with. And it is pretty typical for most community colleges, not only across the nation, but also in the state of Nevada. Um, 
We also um, have uh, pretty significant efforts that are focused on growing our dual enrollment um, population, which is um, actually growing. So not exactly at a rate that we would like to see it, but it is growing. And that is one area where we see, in addition to um, kind of providing, being really nimble to the uh, um, interests of the industry and really reshaping our curriculum quickly so that we can service that pipeline and have training that is directly applicable to the jobs that are available right here, right now. Another area that we're focusing on is dual enrollment. Um, and that is that requires obviously some resources getting um, in much, much closer collaboration with the school district and the councils in particular, as you mentioned. And we do have events that we hold on campus specifically for the councilors. We have counselor appreciation breakfast that is geared exactly at that um, aspect where we know that the people that are talking to um, kids in high school are counselors. And if we can get to those, then we are going to be much more successful in getting the word out about the options that we have. And in terms of the drop, um, like I said, it is across the board. Um, we do have um, um, a challenge where uh, many of our students that are currently enrolled uh, and continuing students are not coming back because when they get a job, they tend to not re-enroll prior to actually earning a degree. And I'll quickly add that we do invite counselors to our campus at least once a year, maybe more. And the last time they came here, I showed them uh, the video, Mike, that you had forwarded on the middle level jobs because I thought it was just so excellent. And I think they really liked that, you know, but, but it's still an uphill battle. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if you had questions, I'm sure we can incorporate them in our next agenda item, uh, which is our outreach. Um, reports, um, reports from any of you that ideas you want to bring in or experiences you've had in uh, reaching out to uh, the community and trying to get people in or new programs we should be running or, and Susan, you're on the end. Good morning, Susan Schilling from the Sheriff's Office. Um, I didn't have a lot to report on last time because I didn't get an update from everyone, but I want to say that I was very impressed with Zach um, Toten's presentation mm -hmm. he gave last time on the Veterans Resource Center and we reached out to him just to try to partner yeah. with jobs that we have and how we can assist maybe with that population and, and this has worked out wonderfully so far we are still very active with the internship program and in fact we had a discussion this morning we had a great idea one of the things that's happening at the jail not that you care, but uh, <laughs> uh, we have a hard time keeping um, staff members because obviously they have to go through a very thorough background. And jail cooks has been all of a sudden a huge population for us that we can't seem to either hire people or keep people. So we're going to have a discussion about partnering how we can either do an insur intern program or maybe some type of work credit while they're, they're learning and maybe when they're done, we could steal them, you know, that kind of thing. So we're, re we're really excited about that one. Um, we had, and I just want to give a, sh a shout out to Marcy's group, is we had an excellent candidate for an internship program. We just couldn't meet with her, but I was so impressed. She was so polite. I, she did everything right. She had a beautiful resume, just a nice, charming young lady, and that's just a great um, reflection of the student population you have here and I was very impressed with that and I'm still going to try to steal her somehow so but that's what that's our main our main thing is sharing our job opportunities with your staff here and your student population um, and then working on that internship program that's our that's our big thing that's great thank, thank you, you so much Chris um, we have just uh, landed a nice new contract for our local operation uh, and one of the comments that came out of the operating staff was, thank God we don't have to hire any new people. We really struggled lately, probably the past year and a half, with getting new longer-term individuals. Now, yes, we're in a what one would consider a low-tech business, although we use handheld computers for pretty much everything that we do. Um, and we have an average annual salary sub the ownership and upper level management of 48000 a year. So warehouse work in of itself is relatively straightforward, but we've actually struggled lately getting individuals to staff through that process. Um, we also at our Christmas party this year awarded uh, two more 20-year 
individuals within our company. So we've got, I think, six at this point. So we're obviously doing a good job on retention. Um, but it's a struggle now lately, and I'm sure Mike probably knows about it. We know Panasonic is really struggling. Um, we need to do more. This whole education thing, I think, is really where we're losing out uh, locally. I think the push has been on this college thing, and I do believe that we need to get more into the two-year, uh, you know, get some secondary education so that you can get into a job and not go off and spend a lot of money doing a long-term college degree. But, you know, for us, that's, that's really what's impacting us the most is the inability to actually hire people that we know that we can work with for an extended period. Thank you. Um, as you all know, this is a legislative year, and we had um, a legislator approach us about um, a bill that requires all surgical techs to be certified. And as you know, uh, now TMCC just developed a program for that. So we, um, I had surveyed the hospitals and that came up that there wasn't a provider up here. And as a result of that, um, Renown has their own surgical tech program and they have their techs go through a one year process. And then um, during that one year time, they pay them an apprenticeship fee. So this would be a problem for them because they would have to, this bill would come into effect um, January of 2018 and therefore they would need to lay off 20 techs that went through the program. So she was wondering whether she should move forward with that. And I discussed with her that TMCC now had the program. I sent over the media release that Kate sent out and so I'm really excited about that because I think there's such a, a demand for those types of staff right. that I think it's, it's going to help um, the area. They're, I know a couple of the hospitals up here had partnered with um, TMCC and CSN in the south for that program, but mm -hmm. um, I'm really pleased to know that um, TMCC, again, is meeting the demand of the community. So um, I had that to share. Yeah. Mike. And Nancy talk about Edon's um, engagement and connection. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the efforts I'm working on the legislative side. <clears throat> and I, I like to look ahead a couple of years and see who's kind of in the pipeline from an elected official perspective, uh, including current legis legislators uh, and potential governor candidates, and find out their <coughs> thoughts on certain issues and community colleges are one of them and I can tell you having talked to one of the front runners although none of them are announced for governor that there is a strong interest in involvement and engagement with the community colleges so I think it's important that you know that we in some way make that point whenever we're talking to our elected officials the importance of community colleges how that really is our job um, you know our conduit to existing jobs and near-term jobs and while the universities are wonderful and we all want to graduate with you know 20 degrees and doctorates are here and doctorates are there the reality is you know the vast majority of nevada's kids will have the best pathway to a to a great job through our community colleges so that's kind of my message i have had several of those conversations um car and offline i'll give you some feedback but i can tell you there's um, there is a move afoot to put more energy and resources behind and support of community colleges, especially when I tell them things like, oh, by the way, you know, through the recession, community colleges took a 25% cut and the universities didn't. And you start giving them some facts out there that they're, they may or may not be aware of, they're more willing to look at that, especially at a time when, for us, our region will grow with jobs, tens of thousands of jobs, that do not require four-year degrees. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we're working, I'm working pretty aggressively offline, um, but it is, you know, ultimately the legislators and the governor will decide, funding perspective, the ability for this organization to be successful. So we wanna try and work that for you because your ability in that area is somewhat limited. Thank you. Anything from the Rotary Club? No. <laughs> 
Oh, you're calling on yeah. me? Yeah, why don't you join us? <laughs> um, back in November, my Rotary Club distributed 1,800 spiral notebooks that were specially printed with the TMCC mascot on it, the TMCC uh, symbol in the one corner and the rotary wheel in the other. These went out to 1,800 elementary children in Alice Maxwell, Sun Valley, and Virginia Palmer schools, along with TMCC branded pens and pencils. So that the idea is to get these, and it went out to every child in those three <coughs> elementary schools. No child didn't get one. And the idea was not just that a child has their, note, their own notebook, but if they lose their notebook, they see the other 29 kids in their class pushing TMCC. I am my Rotary Club president next year, starting on July 1, and I plan to expand it to another couple schools. Most of the money was provided by my Rotary Club and the Rotary District, a little bit from TMCC, and um, I'm looking for another partner. If you're a Rotary Club member, I am looking for another club partner so that we can get, we can't get the $2,000 in district, Rotary District money again. My club can't, but another club can. So if we can find another club that says, this is a good idea, I can, I can add to my money by $2,000. So that's what I'm looking for. That's what we've done. I, it's, I think, been an exciting opportunity to interest younger children. And also, I wonder how many families get this notebook, and the child brings it home, and mom or dad may look at it and say, hey, maybe I should go there. I mean, it's a big push. So that's what I, uh, we did that in November. I'm starting to gear up for that now for next fall. And that teams of people talk to the kids. I think that's. Oh, and oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I left out a big part of right, it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We had TMCC faculty, Rotarians, yeah. TMCC SGA, school district staff from the Educational Alliance. I don't know who else. That's basically, and they, and they go in and make a little pitch at the beginning before they distribute it. I think some of our folks. It's a faculty, too. Yeah, I think you said that, though. I Marketing. can't, I can't hear her. Oh, Wizard the Lizard, the mascot. Oh, and the, and the mascot there. was there, I forgot. The right. TMCZ mascot, <laughs> Wizard, was there, along with Big Bear, who's a mascot from one of the restaurants, and they're a partner in education for one of the elementary schools. So it was like a big, kind of like an event for the kids. And we explained about, we, that started out by asking, how many of you want to go to college? All the kids would raise their hands. And then we explained again about how that career could start here at TMCC. In closing, we did this at Virginia Palmer the year before, only at Virginia Palmer. Those 520 kids got it the year before. When we went back to Virginia Palmer this second year, some of those children said to the representatives, oh, you're the people that want us to go to college. <laughs> so it's a reinforcing, a, a, a simple way, a little expensive. It's four bucks a notebook. And, and they remembered the cover from the year prior. And they remembered the That's... cover because it's very similar, not the same. <laughs> right. Kate's uh, staff developed the yeah. design of the cover of the notebook. So it's one of these things that we've done to promote the college. And it's a fun thing. Um, all the way around. It's also on the internet. It's on TMCC's Facebook page if you want to see a video uh, of it. It was on KOLO TV. We were covered on KOLO TV and KOH Radio, sent a representative. And if anybody wants to help participate in this, it's a fun, it's a fun thing, but we really could use some more money. But if you're a Rotarian, I would yeah. really like you to talk with me. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like mm -hmm. to take uh, my moment here just to report on the metrics and thank you to Sydney and Elena for getting these for us. What we have been doing is taking the numbers from the uh, uh, Career Center of Registered Employers and see if we are impacting the community as we reach out. Um, and so what I did is uh, I stuck in front of for everybody, basically a one-year snapshot. Uh, February a year ago, we were at 578 uh, reported registered employers. We're now over 1,000, so we increased 75%. Um, and uh, Chris, we're still working on this. Um, we still have to go through over almost half of those employers to 
correctly identify their industry hmm. to really see if we, we've got half of them sorted out, uh, which I'm very happy to see that uh, manufacturing and construction are starting to rise in the percentage of employers. So we're starting to get more people in those two industries signing up uh, with the Career Center. Uh, what I will probably be doing is actually splitting up the 500, we're not sure who they are, and sharing them with you so that everybody <coughs> can do a little online research and see if you can find out who these people are so we can correctly get all 1,000 into the correct slot so we really know who we're touching. But um, I think it is, uh, it's a very simple metric, but I think we're improving. And um, thank you. Uh, Sydney Elena for working on that for us and as and we did do I did do a little deeper dive uh, with Chris and uh, some of his group in the logistics and uh, hopefully we, we got some idea of how many logistics companies and uh, really getting to understand that industry and then we'll do the same deep dive and we've been working with uh, Dieter's data and uh, GoAds data to really identify who's out there. And thank you very much, Edon, for your data. That was extremely helpful. So that's what I have. Okay. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with Karin around the plans to expand the culinary program and uh, have um, reached out to a couple of people in the gaming industry to um, meet with Karin and her team to um, really look at again a needs assessment as well as internship opportunities within the gaming sector. Um, I don't know if everyone realizes, I mean I think everyone knows how labor intensive the gaming industry is, but um, at the Nugget where we had a couple of thousand employees, nearly half were in food and beverage. And there are chronic um, shortages again in those areas. Um, and there's quite a um, pathway, frankly, when you get into the culinary side of it. Um, we have positions ranging from bakers to butchers to line cooks to sous chefs. I mean, there's a real graduation. So I think, um, you know, it is going to be a great connection for both to, um, again, not only identify where those opportunities are for jobs, but also um, training grounds for these kids coming through these programs because there's nothing like working in a full production kitchen. So um, I know you're meeting with Peppermill in a couple weeks, and I've got another gentleman I'm going to introduce her to here shortly. So very exciting. Thank you. Thank and, you. And I understand that the needs assessment work is underway. Uh, Dean Marie Mergalopour is sort of uh, taking the, the lead on putting it together with help from uh, Dr. Buchanan. So, Great. Yeah, we're excited about our meeting coming yeah. up. Well, that's very exciting. Very exciting. Okay, so <clears throat> there are a number of marketing things that Edan has been involved in to get the word out about multiple workforce service providers and, and training organizations. One of them um, I have here, if anybody wants copies, this is a new employer workforce resource guide that we recently uh, put out with our uh, January luncheon. This has TMCC listed multiple times in this particular um, booklet um, from the standpoint of posting positions, from internships and apprenticeships, um, from uh, the types of programs that are offered and so forth. So this is also online on the EDON website under our help with hiring section. And the whole idea is to give to employers one place to go where they can find out all the different resources that are available to them. So TMCC is well represented in this and I've had conversations about who the right people are uh, to, to use as the contacts and so forth. Another um, two, two different pieces that have gone out that are uh, incorporating TMCC into the, the pathways. We have one project where we have put together sort of a roadmap for people that are not in the workforce system at all um, to know where they go to get into the system, where they go to get high school equivalencies and so forth. And that is now appearing on the Nevada 211 website, which includes TMCC as well, to know how to start on that pathway and move up into positions, get a job, get an education, it's, and so forth. So um, that's uh, also being distributed by multiple agencies that are part of the Workforce Consortium, so that that piece will be getting out to 
clients across the board and multiple organizations will be spreading the word. And it's really a roadmap to employment, which of course includes education at, at different levels. The other piece that is going out is going to be on the grocery pantry, uh, food pantry bags that are used by the Washington County School District. It's a partnership with community and schools. There will be some conversation in addition to a similar type of roadmap, which TMCC students actually designed. Um, and we had a lot of great um, designs that came to us and, and it really saved us a fair amount of expense of doing that. But those pantry bags will be uh, in English and Spanish. Both of these items that I mentioned are English and Spanish, and the pantry bags will actually have a different sort of roadmap, but it also includes um, high school equivalency, high school graduation, on up to community college or college and, and how to find a job. So those two things are, are going to be sort of blanketing the market in, in different areas. The other thing uh, that we are ready to go with, and it just occurred to me, we have been working on a My Future Activity book. We also have it in English and Spanish. It was copied from a piece that was done by Nevada Workforce Connections down in Las Vegas, and we were uh, we were talking with John about um, branding it with uh, the Nevada Works, since that's kind of where it came from. However, um, in thinking about it, it might be a possibility to brand with TMCC, and it is, um, it's just a kind of activity coloring book. Uh, it's designed for second to fifth graders to start thinking about different careers that exist and talk about the tools um, and the education needed to, to get to where they want to go. And uh, we're working with the school district to get that out to, uh, to those students. So and it also has a piece on the back that's about STEM uh, for the parents. So. Um, I'll work with Kate to take a look at it and see um, how we could perhaps incorporate some sort of TMCC branding into that. So those are um, some of the big things and I would absolutely reinforce that the logistics distribution just in glancing at this, um, it still continues to be a growing sector um, with lots of employment opportunities that people really aren't aware of and so definitely having that as a standalone category is important yeah, to incorporate. Well, we've been working yep. on that and I think we're getting some real numbers. I haven't had a chance to review them but we really, I think we have a full package on that now. So. so. That's what I have. Thanks. John. Uh, I guess several things, but I really have a burning question after Susan's comments on stealing employees. I'm just trying to figure out whether that's a misdemeanor or a felony. <laughs> <laughs> I can it's hardly a felony. <laughs> trust you. <Okay. laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, uh, some of the things that Nevada Works is, is actually working on uh, uh, is multi leveled, uh, but we're uh, putting together some meetings not only with state. Uh, Governor's uh, Workforce Development Board members, but also uh, South Lake Tahoe uh, Chamber of Commerce, as well as Sierra Nevada College, and those are coming up as how we, and it goes right along with things that Karen has already uh, done with Alan up there. So that that's uh, probably one of the big things. Uh, maybe the biggest thing for us is a one-stop center, and, and for the, to bore all of you to tears, there's a one-stop center. There's also a one-stop system, which is very confusing to a lot of people. Uh, the center only becomes just a piece of the overall s system. And uh, we have a need to develop a one, a comp what they refer to in our terminology as a comprehensive one-stop center for the delivery of workforce development services here in, the, in northern Nevada. We have come down to it. We'll be in the Reno Sparks market. Uh, and currently are working with TMCC as well as some others, but working with TMCC on a, uh, a joint project and, and co-location there for that particular facility. Uh, it, whether it's at TMCC or wherever, the, the campus idea for workforce development services is very key to me and to our board uh, in that you, you, it embodies the one stop, uh, but you can do it in a campus environment instead of having everybody co-located in exactly the same building. But there's also that need for extensive communications and, and uh, connectivity electronically, uh, but it can't be just a cold electronic uh, connection. It has to be a warm handoff, a warm connection uh, at the other end. So th those are things that we're working very, very hard on. So. Um, with that, I still have other questions, so <laughs> we'll come back to those. All right, thank you. Cheryl? Which one? 
<laughs> Chair Ward. We'll just keep going around the table. That, that's very yeah. Cheryl, number one. Cheryl, Cheryl W. Well, and you like I, him yes, I was here first. So. Yeah, yeah, but my one. name starts with C, my last name, so I'm number one, you're number two. Um, well, I didn't do community well, reports well, as you did, but um, I, as you're talking, I was thinking I'm the representative at TMCC for the uh, refugee resettlement program. And most of the children that are coming with those families are young, and so my goal is to work with them to get them to understand what is the community college in the mm -hmm. first place and let them know that we've got this, these opportunities. But the other part of that is the, those refugees have to find jobs within the first three to six months of being here, and a lot of them go into manufacturing. So yeah. I could, would love to connect with you on that. But I think that this... I know this is a controversial issue, but I think it's something I'm proud of our community um, and, and Dr. Karina Black at Northern Nevada International Center for putting this forward, although it's on hold right now, but there's 60 families that came in the, in the fall and there's a few more in the pipeline, but I think this is something to be proud of our community and I think that um, working with the different agencies, that would be something that we could definitely, and TMCC of course, work together on. But that's not, that's, thank you very much because that is uh, 60 people that we desperately need in our workforce and uh, very often those individuals are very well trained in various areas. So I think if we could figure out how to make that connection with the Career Center so that we can see their resumes. and. I can definitely get I you think connected. if, you know, with Sydney, somehow we can make the connection and that we just make sure that we understand exactly what their status is as long as we well, can Well, they're, they're properly, refugees, but they have yeah. um, residency. <coughs> so they, we can they see have that. work permits. In fact, as I long, think yeah. they have six months to find a job, and most of them are finding jobs in three months. Wonderful. <laughs> so we'd be more than happy to, at least for the manufacturing community, community to see what we can do. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl? Cheryl? Cheryl C? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as Faculty Senate Chair, most of my work is internal to TMCC. Uh, one of the things that we've been working at system-wide is an intellectual property um, policy here at TMCC, and I'm pleased to report that after a lot of consternation, and John, you were there at that meeting, and a lot of discussion, we finally got to put the people who are developing the policy and the faculty senate chairs in the same room to talk about the issues. And the, that meeting was very productive. Um, a lot of the concerns that the faculty were raising about um, wide sweeping intellectual property rights being taken away were given back and, and a lot of things were changed so that it's actually becoming a policy that um, not only we can live with but is good for both the institution and for the faculty who work at the institution. So I'm very happy about that. I'm, I've also been volunteered and I accepted the volunteering to serve on the search for the Vice Chancellor of Community Colleges to represent the faculty senates. Um, for community colleges. My fellow faculty senate chairs either doomed me to this or, <laughs> or congratulated me with this. I'm not sure which, but um, I am glad to serve on that because I think this is long overdue to have a vice chancellor of community colleges. So I'm pleased to be able to take part in that search. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, oh, we're, al we're almost right on time here. Uh, let's see. Uh, the next um, thing was... Um, we're going to do, I'll do my informational thing very, very quickly here, and then we'll take a quick break, and then we'll move on to the main agenda, and we should be able to close out by 11. Uh, agenda item 7, Women in Manufacturing and STEM Careers. Uh, this agenda item is a request from Regent Allison Stevens. Regent Stevens heard a presentation by Pittsburgh Plate Glass, PPG in Reno at the Nevada Commission for Women and requested that it be put on the IAC and CCC agendas. Okay, women in manufacturing, it's the one thing I actually know something about. <laughs> uh, so very quickly, um, the effort to recruit more women to careers at all levels of manufacturing has been a very long time and ongoing effort. Uh, most large companies have internal programs to recruit and train women, and there are efforts at the national level led by the Manufacturing Institute of the National Association of Manufacturers 
and a National Trade Association Women in Manufacturing. Uh, we've had a number of convocations tied to Manufacturing Day here in Northern Nevada, which were very successful and would like to do more of that. Um, I believe that from the perspective of the TMCC IAC, that encouraging women to train at TMCC for manufacturing careers is part of our larger mission, which we have been talking about today, getting good people in to be trained for the great jobs that are available in our community. And it's just a subset of that. So I don't see it as um, something that um, is separate from what we've been doing all along. Um, I am assembling some information materials on successful programs that I've got through these two associations uh, that can help in ways it just our general outreach to everybody. Um, we are looking for good people, uh, whether they be women or men or, you know, from whatever country um, to bring them in. So I will be sending that out to you um, as I get it. Um, there's some good. Uh, the Manufacturing Institute has some toolkits for activities for counselors, parents, schools, the individuals, and so I will be sharing that uh, with you when I find some that are not this thick. And um, just to show you that there is ongoing efforts, actually even in the Washoe County and Carson City School Districts at this time, the Manufacturing Institute and Dream It, Do It are in the schools. You will hear more about this uh, in Washoe County and in um, Carson City School Districts, and I believe in Douglas now, for all students, but this is the one for women in manufacturing. So, and there's some other ones. Mm -hmm. So there is things going on, and anybody that's interested, but I, I will certainly pass these, we can pass those around. So that's what I have to say on that. Right now, it's a complex issue. I think this, the big statistic is that 47%, uh, I think it's on one of those, uh, women are 47% of the workforce in general, but only 27% of manufacturing. But I think it, we want the young ladies to basically just be thinking about careers. And as I always say, we want the best and brightest in manufacturing, so we need the girls. <laughs> so that is what I have to say on that. So we'll take a quick five minute break. Yes, Mike. Just a, a, a potential connection. I know uh, Nancy may have mentioned it before, but we, we're working to attract women in engineering as well. <clears throat> and if you go out to Tesla, most, I won't say most, many of the jobs they're hiring for manufacturing in that facility are engineering. Engineering, yes. So there may be, as we market this, we market it as a women in manufacturing and engineering and try and, you know, m I basically think. multiply the focus and the effort because we, most people think of manufacturing that are not in manufacturing as a dirty industry. Right. You start talking about engineering and the technology piece, it becomes a much more palatable industry for women. I think one of the brochures, actually, I just pulled these out of the back of one of the toolkits. Uh, one of them is, is that 65% uh, of research, development, engineering, jobs are in manufacturing. So really, if you could go to be an engineer, you have a 65% chance of ending up manufacturing anyway, because that's where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. And I think about half my engineering department is female, so mm -hmm. great. So anyway, that's what I know about that. So I have, we can carry on this discussion tied in with the other things that we're talking about. Five, eight minute break. The, the rest of the meeting will be dedicated to finding out how we can support TMCC through the legislative session and Kyle's going to give us some information there will be more information flowing throughout the legislative session but this is to kind of get us started turn so, it over so thank you and I'm uh, I'm gonna stand over here so I can kind of uh, wave at the slides rather than be at the podium across the room um, so we're going to talk about the 2017 legislative session, and uh, for the, I know everyone here, um, I'm Kyle Dalby. I'm serving as the Interim Dean of Technical Sciences, and I'm still currently the legislative liaison 
for the for TMCC. There's, there's one or more per each institution that works with the system office, and so I've maintained that role, which uh, we'll see we'll see how it goes down the road. But for this session, it's me. This will be my fifth session working with the legislature, so it's going on uh, year nine and ten. Um, and this is the first one, I think, listening to the governor's state of the state since 2009. That we didn't feel like we were the Patriots at halftime. I mean, this is like <laughs> we, we came, came out with higher education on the top of the agenda, and, and it stayed there, and the budget penciled out um, somewhat in our favor. So we're um, we're going to go through some of the numbers. We're going to talk a little bit about the funding formula, and then I have a page of notes from some of the questions and comments that were brought up because I think they'll get answered, or maybe even spur on additional comments. So. So for those of you who don't, don't know or do know, quick reminders, the, the, the uh, legislature meets in odd years. It started uh, this past Monday on February 6th. It'll go through June 5th, 120 days. They always have at the top of it is the budget discussion. Um, there's some other things that are emerging as well, there's, uh, but everything seems to relate back to the budget and that's one of our big, has been one of our biggest concerns, especially when we're uh, in the depths of the recession. Uh, the Senate holds 21 seats, the Assembly has 42, a total of 63 members. I'm going to show you the Northern people. Uh, the party lines are skewing Democratic in both the House, or, uh, both the Assembly and the Senate. Our legislative, legislative strategy, when we talk about it, NSHE leads the legislative strategy for the system. But the colleges and the university and the state college support, DRI as well. Um, so we support the, the NG legislative agenda, which is primarily the budget, and I'm going to show you the spreadsheet. We build awareness um, through the term as well as off-season, uh, off so to speak. We build awareness and support of college with the elected officials. And then we, then we inform the TMCC community and the IAC and other stakeholder groups about what's going on. So we follow the system's lead when it comes to session and what they're asking for. We build that awareness of the college with those stakeholders, and then we inform other people as well as needed. So the NG legislative priorities, which should be no surprise, I think it's come before this group, um, has to do with several things, um, base budget, salary, merit, step benefits. Dr. Hilgerson mentioned some of this in the President's comments. Um, case low growth, which means that as, that, uh, as we have a pie of money, now that we are serving more students, we don't want the same size pie, we need a bigger pie in order to accommodate the growth without losing money. And uh, the, the biggest project that was last session and will be completed this session is the UNLV Medical School. Um, we don't speak to that because it's not in our realm at TMCC. Um, the enhancement request, the career and tech education funding increase, that's a big one. Um, uh, we'll talk about that. The Silver State Opportunity Grant, which is the college's um, first need, or sorry, the, the state's first need-based uh, program for uh, scholarships for students that we helped support last session, and this will be its second session, and it's, it exists, but it needs to be funded. And then capacity building uh, requests that came through. So we'll talk about each of those as we go in. So let's talk about the career and tech education because this is this is the fun one. Uh, this one involves a, a little bit of a dive into the funding formula. So I apologize in advance if I confuse you all, but um, there's four people in the state that understand the funding formula, and sometimes I think I'm one of them until I give one of these presentations. But I think we got something going here. So what we're trying to do, the CTE enhancement, just so you know, and I, I pulled a quote before we uh, before I started. The governor in his state of the state said 60% of Nevadans 25 to 34 will hold a post-secondary credential or degree, so not just degree, but credential, by 2025. That is one of the high, that's the higher education goal. So when we were developing the budget last year that went to the governor's office in September of 16, there was a directive from his office that said, tell us what you can do for career and technical education. And that's where this comes from. For TMCC, I'm going to tell you how it pencils out, but we're looking at roughly $2 million in the first year of the biennium, and then two and a half in the second year. And, and as Dr. Hilberson said, this would be a formula funding adjustment that will carry forward in, in, until something changes down the road. So it'll be, it'll be a permanent, and the dollar amounts will change based on the enrollments, but that's what's projected for us for the two years of the next biennium. So to get you, get, kind of get your brains around this, so we operate the funding formula um, is 80% uh, of it is based on a weighted semester credit hour. And that is um, um, students take a credit, if they take a three credit class, that's three credit hours. Each one of those classes that we offer is weighted, which means some are weighted at a one, which is a base model, kind of speak, um, and then the others are because they might be more expensive to deliver or, or um, weighted higher. So lower division tends to be lower, upper division tends to be higher. So graduate classes are weighted higher than freshman classes, that sort of thing. This is how it breaks out. If you'd like this handout, I have it. It's from 2013. It talks about all the different clusters. 
This up here is actually liberal arts, math, social sciences, and just, just grabbing some, um, some numbers in here, you can see they're all weighted at a 1.0. And that just means that when you get the dollar amount, you get one times the dollar amount of the state appropriation. When you come into the trade and tech clusters, which is the CTE, the, the four that I've highlighted there are the ones that are targeted with this enhancement, it's a 2.0. So that means the amount of money that the state's gonna give us per weighted semester credit hour, we're gonna get double. We're already getting that right now. So an English 101 class, let's see if I've got this on this one. Okay, so let me go back here, back up just a little bit. So the weighted semester credit hours times the weighting times the dollar amount per the weighted semester credit hours is our state funding. Stay with me. Okay, I get that little bit. Oh my gosh, here we go. So, so TMCC is roughly 200,000 weighted semester credit hours. That's our budget. It's 204, but I round it. Times the state pays us because of the size of the pie, about $155 per weighting semester credit hours. And that's how we get our $31 million operating budget from our state appropriation. It's not our only money that we have. We have, of course, tuition and fees and that sort of thing. So again, this is the people, this is the pie, and the end game is the $31 million. And if the pie shrinks, then we, the number will change. So bringing that down to a class level here, if we have a class right here that's weighted at a 1.0, which could be English 101, uh, 102, a core humanities rated at a one. You get one student in there, takes it for three credits. It's weighted at a one. The appropriation is $155. We get $465 for that class. I gotta ask this. What, why? I, I thought it was $153. Is that what's projected is, for the, the next budget? This is the one I used from the current budget. It toggles between 150 and 158, depending on which projection okay, we're using. Okay, so, because I think on yeah. the next biennium, it's actually 153, I think. Right, in the, in, in, in the capacity. Um, I just want to make sure I got that right. And the enhancement piece on the, on the caseload will keep that at okay. that level or even bump it up a little bit. Okay. Can I ask a question, yep. too, about the, the course completion? So. You get the money, you have to give the money back. Okay, so, so that's somebody... a very good. Thank you for asking that. So one student takes three credits, 1.0, and passes that class, we get the funding. If they get a W, we don't get the funding. Um, so it passes the class, which, which actually completes the class, because if they get an F, we get the funding. And that's been one of those that's gone back and forth with percentage of, but right now it's 100%. So the 1.0 classes are here. The, if you come down here and you change that to a 2, you can see it doubles. This is what exists now. So our current on a CTE is one student, three credits, you get double the funding, means we get $930 state appropriation plus the tuition and fees. What we're requesting is to change that 2.0 to a 4.0. That's what the ask is on the table. And that's what's in the governor's budget. So we would actually get on the career and tech education side, not all the classes, just the four that I showed you, I'll come back to it. We would get a 4.0 times waiting on the, um, on the funding. Now what does that do for us? Those are the speaking points we need to have the group help us with, and we've, we'll put out some information, but it helps us sustain programs that are currently under grants. It helps us build. It helps us support classes that are really kind of moderate, moderate to low enrollment because of the facilities. You can only have so many students in an auto lab working on an engine. You can't put 25, 30 students in there. Back to Nancy's question. That student, and at $1,800, doesn't happen if the day before he takes or she takes her final exam, they get a job offer they can't refuse. With the Sheriff's Department. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. And we don't get credit for putting them to work, yeah. right? So uh, <laughs> Just let them it, it actually is, if, if the student withdraws from a class from up to the 60% mark in the semester, which in the fall usually pencils out about Halloween, okay. then we don't get the funding. If they go past that date, the withdrawal date, that you can get a W, we have to sign them an F because they've attended to the class, in which case we would get the funding. Okay, so you got to get them to 60%. Okay, so that's at least reasonable. And our goal is to get them through with a grade because we right. really, at some point, they're going to come back. But as they develop their skills and as demand increases, they're going to get job offers. And exactly. if they're not employed, they're going to go take it. I, I think there's some students in some of our, stuff, our, our classes, the production systems, who get enough uh, knowledge in like the first week to make it through an interview and they're hired. I mean, they're out the door. So. So that's the struggle we're up against. There's nothing in there that corrects the W day or anything like that. It's just an increase in funding on the search. So again, coming back to it, some are weighted at one, and you can see upper division goes up. And for example, for those of you who may not look at the whole spectrum, um, UNR teaches graduate level classes. A doc student would drive this formula at a 5.5. So that's because there's, because there's lower, lower enrollment. There's not that many students. So the key in this is CTE classes. So my thinking is how do you 
include more of the current curriculum in the CTA. In the yeah. So what they've done is the, the, the directive came, said, please look at these codes. These are called SIP codes. It's with the C, CIP. It stands for Classification of Instructional Programs. And they said, we want you to look at 47, 48, and 49. 46, 47, 48, 49. Construction trades, mechanic, precision production, transportation. Those are the ones we want to look at because those tie with the economic development plan of the state. Okay. What about now with the, 15? Right, Which one's 15? 15 at the very bottom. Engineering? Mm -hmm. That's not in our CT enhancement right now. Mm -hmm. Now, now some, a lot of, another group that's categorized as CTE is nursing. And that's one that's not funded that we really could use because that's a very expensive program. What the legislature did back in 2007 when they mandated us double our, our enrollment was they funded CTE, or they funded nursing program in the summer, which is the only one that's funded in the summer for a state appropriation. So there's ways to work it different ways. But for right now, it's these four. We currently get double the funding. We're looking to make that four times the funding. So the reason this is out there, who knows what this is? Tesla. This is Tesla. It's not the actual picture. This is a model. Uh, because that's why it says you are here. It's not from space. It's from the, uh, mm -hmm. it's not, not a Google Maps because I don't think they'd like that. But this right here, the black, if you haven't been out there, this black outline is what's built right now. This piece is framed. This piece is framed and this is how big it's going to be. It'll be the biggest building on, pl on the planet. When we talk about what Tesla needs and their, their partner Panasonic um, and we look at the, how much it's going to cost to build programs, that most of the programs are built. They're built under grants, but we're trying to get the pipeline going with students. One of the new initiatives that um, has come up that we've started under technical sciences is the Panasonic P3 program. I won't get into depth, in depth on it today, but it was, a, it was basically <coughs> Panasonic and the Governor's Office of Economic Development showed up at, the, at our uh, Applied Technology Center in a panic the week before Christmas and said, I need 2,400 people by December of 17. And I said, <laughs> I have 75 in the pipeline, so <laughs> I, share your, I, I, I share your problem. That's a good problem. You like to see the unemployment rate go down. I was pretty happy to hear that ours was 4.2% in Washoe County. I go to uh, talk to some people across the country in the Midwest, and they're like, we're 3.2. We're 3. That's unheard of. So getting people in the pipeline is what we're trying to do. Supporting these programs, expanding them, that's what's all behind the career and tech uh, enhancement. I'm going to move, just keep moving because I want to keep you on schedule. So again, it's an accelerated pipeline. We had 75 students in our production system program in all of fall. We have 110 right now and we're a month into the se session and they can keep adding in, 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 uh, throughout the semester. Okay, so that was the CTE enhancement. So there won't be a quiz on the funding formula, but if you have questions, I'll be at the snack bar after you. After you. Um, but the other piece out there is the um, enhancement funding, capacity. And the way that the last year, again, this all transpired last spring semester, the system asked us to give an enhancement. Um, if you could just build enhancement and get, uh, or capacity and get people in, what would you do? And we said the gateway classes, which is a system initiative, is English and math. And we want to put forward a proposal that we would hire more English math faculty. <clears throat> That's what's classified as, as gateway courses, because if they don't take English and math, they're probably not going to finish a degree or certificate. And then we're going to throw in science, because we're really hurting in science for labs, et cetera. We're going to throw in dual credit. And this is all going to pencil out as we would like to um, build up our labs, hire more faculty as needed in those areas, and it'll cost TMCC a million dollars. Can you, can, that's our enhancement request for capacity. And this, the board put that through. Other schools have different things they're doing, and, uh, but this is what we're doing. And then the caseload growth, which means that because we did have a little bit, as Dr. Hilgerson mentioned, um, the even fiscal years, FY14, 16, and next year FY18 is our benchmark years. And because we grew from 14 to 16, we're looking at a million dollars each year. So even though we're seeing an enrollment decline now, last year when it, when it counted, we were up. Next year when it counts, we want to be up yeah. because we get the caseload growth. Um, and a couple other things. Uh, by the way, this is, a, this is a, uh, one of our newest welding instructor here, Trent, talking with a middle school student. We talked about outreach. There's a couple of events coming up. Working on a virtual welder, like we set that up for you guys, you can have fun with that. So you can weld on a computer, and if you make a mess, it doesn't matter. But it kind of gets the kids excited because they think it's cool. It's got a virtual reality helmet and gets them really jazzed up. So the, the, the other things in the governor's budget that we should talk about that we support as a system is the Silver State Opportunity Grant, funded at $5 million each year of the biennium. It was funded at, I think, 2 and a half each year, so it's doubling the money. The Millennium Scholarship, those of you who have kids that are in the higher education pipeline right now, 
It expires in 2018 if they don't put more money into it, so just so you're aware of that. Part of that has to do with the fact that they've expanded it. It used to only cover 12 credits, now it's up to 15. So more students pulling down more funds. The uh, workforce uh, funding, the um, workfor uh, workforce investment in a new Nevada uh, funding, 3.5 and 4.5 million dollars on that. That's again the governor's office, but we support it because we can apply for those funds. And then the big one is that when we put all of our budget forward, we also had to put forward a 5% reduction, which was not included in the governor's budget. So we're, we were looking at a submission that had plus and minus, and now it just has the plus. <coughs> So this is a, a breakout. Um, I think this was in. I think this got emailed out. If not, we can. This is what the Board of Regents requested for all of the institutions. <clears throat> this is the executive budget, how it penciled out, and then there's the comparison. So the top line is merit and benefits, which we requested merit and benefits, and it came out with nothing. But down here, there was nothing for the cola, two percent each year, and that came back with a dollar amount almost the same. So we still pushed for this a little bit, but we did get this down here. Um, and then you can see the different schools here. TMCC is right here. Again, this is just the caseload growth. Um, and then uh, this is this is DRI and UNLV. Well, yeah. Kyle, I oh, did. I, I recently learned, and I haven't had time to really study it, that unfortunately, the um, health, the the PEB costs are going up proportion to the cola, yep. which is a problem. Yep. You know, that's not uh, good when it, especially since. <clears throat> faculty salaries at TMCC have been relatively stagnant. So anyway, I just wanted so to that's, mention that's that. So that's why we still, you, you made that discussion earlier right. about the merit would be nice because right. this will get offset, you know, and it has in the past. And, uh, and those of us who have been here <clears throat> a decade plus are pretty excited that there's not a reduction of any kind in the salary, which there had been, because in years past we have gotten a salary reduction, a furlough, and an increase in benefits. Uh, but yeah, we need to, that's why that one comes into play more to actually bump up salaries. So again, this is just a, again a spread that goes down the list. This is the formula enhancement, the CTE. It only affects the four community colleges, um, and then uh, the enhancement system wide. That's where we're talking about biology, math, and English. The other schools are there too. So, um, how we're going to track and work throughout the legislative session is there's an email called, uh, from TMCC. It's called govrelations at tmcc.edu. You're going to start getting some correspondence from that. Um, you're welcome to unsubscribe, just reply to it. But they'll push out information on hearings, might send something out that says, I need somebody who can speak on this at 3 o'clock on Monday. Um, and we're going to uh, be communicating that way. We do that with the campus, and we're going to include the IAC group in that. We've been giving nonstop tours of facilities. Dr. Hogerson has been meeting nonstop with people coming in and out of here. Uh, just to find out what we're doing. Now that the session's um, going, it's tougher to get them, but thank you for your help. Um, we've had people come in um, that you've said, hey, I know this person, can we get them in for a tour? And then we're gonna use the NELIS and the pers personalized legislative tracking. NELIS stands for Nevada, Le uh, Nevada Legislative Information System. So Valerie, if you could click on this, this graphic, it'll just pop up the, should pop up the web, uh, homepage. So this is the Nevada Legislature homepage. If you want to know anything, I suggest you go there. If you can't find it, just shoot me an email. On this side over here, there's a button, personal legislative tracking. You can click that one right there. It's all the way over the right. And you are able to, I haven't logged in, but you're able to search bills, budgets, and that sort of thing uh, right along here. Um, now, uh, we did have a comment about the surgical tech. I looked it up. It's in, it's in BDR format. That stands for bill draft, which means that LCB, Legislative Council Bureau, is still drafting it, so there's no text, but I flagged it in our system. You can check, and it'll automatically send you updates. Uh, but if you go to, if you click on bills right there. And what about the one that's meeting today? today so that's the one we're going to. Oh, so good. Okay. right here, Valerie, in that, if you put in uh, 19, or SB 19. <clears throat> so this is uh, Senate Bill 19. So we can read about this one. You come in here, and it, it'll actually tell you uh, there's a text button, and this is, the, this is an overview. The text okay. is the actual bill itself. Um, they're trying to expand and require um, districts to offer and not hinder the amount of dual credit that can be, option, uh, can be offered to students. Is there a fiscal note on this bill yet? Or is um, it just an unfunded that's mandate? What, that's what they're talking about today. Because okay. the, the money behind it is who's going to pay for yeah, the credits right. the, uh, for the students. Yeah. And some schools have a, districts have a robust AP program, uh, like Washoe County. And some districts have none. And so the ones that have none, the dual credit really sells. Uh, the ones that do, you can't really butt with it. Um, they don't want it to compete in the class. They don't want a student to have to decide, I'm going to take English for AP or I'm going to take English 101 for credit. Mm -hmm. And there's different philosophies on that. Um, 
on how they can get through, whether they take a test or whether they get the college credit, but that's part of the discussion. However, the success rate in a dual credit class is much, much higher yeah. than a high stakes AP test, and we've got data on that yep. if you're interested. Yeah, that would be interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it's tailored yeah. around the student. I've got two kids out of McQueen High School. One took a bunch of AP, got like one class comp. The other one got a whole semester. So it, 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 it's just the format and the kid, and it and really needs to be a fit that's working. And the hearing today is at 3.30. 3.30, yeah. And I can't remember if I can listen to it or not. But it, I'm, yeah, all of this is streaming. So if you yeah, come in here. because um, I really want to hear. I think I'll shoot out the link. Chet, I don't see it on Chet will do a great job. Oh, okay. Okay, so can we go back to the presentation real quick and then we can do questions. So let's see, um, oh yeah, so then um, I do have, I'm tracking about 30 plus bills and BDRs now and you can, I can export, a, uh, if anyone says, what are you tracking, do you want to see it? I can export a nice little PDF that shows what we're tracking in the status, but this changes hourly. Um, and so here's some to watch. And again, we made this about a week ago, so it's, it's already changed, but um, there's a tuition charge one, Assembly Bill 24, talks a lot about veterans and if they're stationed here again, uh, in-state rate, that kind of thing. Uh, SB 19 is about dual credit, we just talked about that. Uh, the fun ones here are the BDR 3428, which talks about governing community colleges, the governance, um, no, no text on that yet, nor on the one that's you know, the Higher Education Reform Act. Hmm. So those will be up and coming. And then there's also a Promise Scholarship Program, which I'm hearing the chatter that it's it's highly it's it's uh, proposed by Mo Dennis out of the South and they're talking about CSN. Hope it would be something that would go statewide. For those of you who are not familiar with the Promise programs, the Tennessee Promise and the American College Promise, the way they're funded is they um, the student owes X, it might be ten thousand dollars, and then their grants and their scholarships are all deducted, and whatever is left, the gap is what the Promise programs pay. So there is a fiscal impact on that, but it's not the whole amount of tuition being waived. Here's one that came up again um, on guns on campus. It has to do with the one that talks about the, you can bring it if you lock it in your vehicle during class. That was, that surfaced last session as well. So, how you can help. So how many of you have a TMCC pin? <coughs> you bring, bring, but you're not wearing it. Too. I am. Today. I have, <laughs> so, yeah, you, so you're in luck. There's an extra one for your extra suit. <laughs> okay. I so, need an extra one. No. So if you, so if, so if you brand yourself with, uh, if you brand yourself with TMCC later. stuff, it's a good discussion point. So I'll hand these out. Put some more up here. Do you need one? Um, I go to the, the legislature with all the, uh, with all the, um, the swag and that kind of thing. Um, you can't give them any gifts because I'm registered as a lobbyist. But they say, oh, TMCC, tell me, tell us your story. What they want to hear, for those of you who don't know, this is Brandy Davis in our graphic arts marketing department, uh, rock star in that category, and then one of our former, three of our former students. When I brought them down to the legislature two sessions ago and they spoke, that's what the legislators want to hear. So they'd rather hear from, the, I'm the last person they want to hear from because I'm, you know, you're, oh, you're the spokesperson for the college kind of thing. But if they can hear from business and industry people, if they can hear from faculty, if they can hear from employees and students, that's what that, that that really makes a difference. But we're here to help coordinate. So uh, Valerie, Valerie, I'm gonna loop you into this now because I forgot to put your name on the slide. So lucky you. So so me and uh, Lisa, Valerie, and I will help coordinate visits. If you have somebody who wants to come in and talk, if you want us to go talk to them. But one of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna try to get um, people down to the legislature to testify, to talk to people, and that sort of thing, just to to kind of give the perspective. Um, and then here's some northern ones, which I think most of you know the, the list, the, the roster of the northern legislators. If you know somebody, you want to reach out, talk to them. We can follow up with, uh, with a meeting on what the college does, especially if they're in our service area. And we're, and we're in good shape because uh, Skip Daly is a graduate. It's a lot of them have community college yeah. experience. Uh, Jill's Teresa. actually on the assembly side. Oh, yeah, Jill's on the wrong yeah. side, yeah. sorry. No, no big. Uh, Lisa teaches yeah. for us. Jill has ta taught for us. Um, so it's, it's mixed, but it's, you know, we. We've got a lot of friends there that remember the community college you know, and what we did. So. And I know this is an obvious thing, but um, I know uh, I went over and took Julia Ratty. We met with <coughs> and, um, it was really great. I, I have found generally that people are very supportive of the community college, but I still think we need to have a few takeaways that we're trying, mm -hmm. kind of like WC1, you know, that um, mm -hmm. that everybody can kind of be chanting, and maybe one of them is with this funding, we can educate 2,000 more kids for the yeah. workforce development. You know, whatever that is, that you know, to where they yeah. really get it that, you know, we've got all these people that we're trying to push into the, you know, to fund all these positions. This money will help us get so many there. Or, you know, Mike's <laughs> comment about, 
we were down, we were cut 25%, this gets yeah. us up to, you know, halfway yeah. back, or whatever yeah. those poignant things are that are going to grip them, we need to all be kind of saying the same thing, and that was the only thing with Julia was we didn't really have a takeaway at the end, even though she was very, she yeah. gave you her personal cell phone, so yeah. Yeah. she clearly <laughs> was, wants, uh, to hear. wants to hear what's going on, but I think we need a um, a couple of yeah, those. Well, I, I like that one, yeah. and especially if we connect it to the middle level, the mid-wage jobs that that video captures. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good, yeah, good one. The yeah. other thing, though, that I that I want to really emphasize is, I think this dual enrollment bill is going to get legs, and I think it could end up uh, being the way that the Republicans and the Democrats crats compromise on that uh, educational savings money that it could be a, a part of that and so I think we really want to watch that closely mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you though that my understanding and I need to verify this is that the uh, Clark County School District and Washoe County School Districts uh, are, uh, are have serious concerns about the, the fiscal impact and so if we can help them find a way to fund it I think that it can go much more smoothly than who's than it pushing might. that. Who's pushing that particular one? Yeah. So well, I can. Uh, you know, I, uh, Kyle, can you answer that? Yeah, uh, kind of who's right. sponsoring it? Go back to the bill. Uh, I, I will tell you that the yeah. State yeah. Department yeah. of Ed <coughs> came up with a joint oh, no, resolution with the NC Regents back in yeah. Yeah. September, which was wonderful. Yeah. So I think the board members yeah. all over the state yeah. support the idea. Yeah. Right, but it's but money. It, well, it's money, and, and I think for Washoe County School District, part of it is there has been an over-reliance on advanced oh. placement. Yeah, sorry. And that's, I think, been a problem this, locally. So that bill is sponsored by the governor's office. Ah, so. that's interesting. So there, there are a couple things uh, to piggyback yeah. on. The, we, we, we can write up some Very points, and I've got some notes on what's happening. Um, there's several things in the CTE realm, but we have to remember, too, is that um, it's not all about career and tech because, the, first of all, the career and tech enhancement is only four of the areas that we teach. It doesn't include a lot of the other career and tech. And then at the same time, the, the transfer mission and the other missions of the institution have to make sure that they don't, they don't get lost in the discussion right. because every student needs communication, English, and math um, to go through the, the career and tech programs and also to transfer on to the university. And when the university is burgeoning, and, and having capacity problems, that's something the community colleges can work on the pipeline like has happened around the country. So we want to keep that on the radar, that it's not all about CTE. That seems to be the headliner one because the talk is that they're going to need some kind of credential but not a four-year degree, but that does include our two-year degrees. So. And Kyle, can you, uh, back to the dual credit just for a yeah. moment, can you share a little bit about our partnership with ACE Charter School? It is incredible and it's such a great model that really is fits into that whole dual enrollment, dual credit picture. Right. I know you know more details than I, I do. I do, and I think, I think it started maybe even before you were there, Jim, right? No, no, you started. started. Good, okay, so Jim, Jim has the history on that, but I'll speak to it and he'll jump up from the back if I miss something. ACE Charter High School is sponsored by the school district. It stands for Academy for Career Education, and it's, uh, it's located on Vassar Street, and we have an MOU that they bring their students. They actually bus them over to the Applied Tech Center and, um, and then they take our classes and they go through a cohort. So some of the classes, they, they're embedded in with other students, but sometimes it's only ACE students. Um, and we have upwards of 63, I think, enrollments in all of the programs. And those students will come out with a, with a diploma and a um, certificate and maybe even a degree, depending on the Actually, Kyle, there's... How many are there? Uh, good morning, Jim New for the record. Um, the, the ACE model is, uh, has two legs. Uh, the original model was uh, ACE was bringing groups of students uh, from their campus to the Applied Technology Center for their group, their students to attend in a cohort but be taught by our instructors. It started in the diesel program probably about 
10 years ago, I'll bet. It's gone, it's gone that way. So I would say at this point in time, there's probably about 30 to 40 students in the diesel program. About five years ago, we uh, expanded it into the machining program, and I would estimate that there's probably about another 25 in that program. Subsequent to that, we also expanded the model that we're using for the TMCC High School Technical Pathway option for ACE students, where they come to the campus, but they're in multiple programs, they're intermingled with regular college students as well. And I, uh, as a matter of fact, just the other day when I was at the campus, I talked to three of them that were in the HVAC program. So I would estimate that um, ACE alone is probably putting closer to 100 students in that building in a semester. So. It is. It's fantastic. How do you grow that? So that's the thing. We're, we're, well, we we're, are. We're trying. But, no, but again, money, you know, is there, do they have a um, limit on how many they can? We're adding 10,000 new jobs <clears throat> to northern Nevada every year. 10,000. More than half of those require STEM level skills. And while 100 is wonderful, when you're adding 10,000 jobs a year, we got some scaling to do. And, and on, the, on the other side too, with, with Panasonic, they're looking, they're looking for those thousands of people. So we do, have, we do have several things that we're looking at going forward. Um, we're talking about maybe bringing back, we've done a limited amount of these, but like a summer camp experience for seventh and eighth graders that they could get them in the pipeline. We, we've been we've been kind of limited on our, our marketing, we've been limited on our recruitment. So the college um, has been kind of marketing and recruiting down senior, junior, sophomore, and that's the, probably not a very effective model because by the time they're juniors, they know what they're doing. They probably or don't know what they're doing, and they're not going to figure it out. But if we can get them grades yeah. five, six, seven, and eight, we can plant that seed. There's truth to yeah. that. We also um, we also when I started working over at the tech center, I wanted to, to look at marketing and how we talk to counselors. Yeah because the counselors, they can tell you what an auto student does uh, because they have a car. Yeah. You know, they must change oil tires and oil computers yeah. because I bought an extended warranty. But if you do a HVAC or a machinist, they don't really know. So how can we, how can we um, kind of give them more speaking points on that? But I have a grad student who's looking for a doc project who came in two days ago and said, hey, I'd like to do something related to that. And I was like, yay, because we can actually maybe get a study on the perception of counselors and then we can shift to to um, uh, make something happen there where they can push more people to their careers. Mm -hmm. We do a counselor breakfast every year. Student services facilitates that. I'd like to um, possibly hold one or similar down at the tech center. But again, we're not just, again, we're back to the careers that are the career in tech, but we have to keep in mind the whole mission of the institution. So. But it's particular to answer your question on ACE. So thank you, Jim. So. To, just to round up yep. this so Should we go don't go too much over time here. Yep. Um, Kyle, so you'll be keeping in touch with us. You will we'll be on your yes, and you will send us these materials. I think they were in the package that unfortunately didn't get out last night. But will you keep us updated and let us know what we can do? Um, yeah, it'll probably be overload because it'll be flying. That, that, um, especially that, as we get later in the session, but right. that's better than not. Really. But that's better than not. If you have questions, to call you or to call you. Or send an email, email to me and send an email to Kyle if you have questions, or you can show up for something, or you want to show up for something. Or the if you're down there and you want to yeah. Uh, yeah. Meet, meet, meet people, it's a little more efficient because I can navigate right. you to offices and that sort of thing. So. so how we can be helpful, if you have an idea of how you would like to be helpful but aren't sure whether it's mm -hmm. appropriate, please check, uh, send Kyle an email so we don't get ourselves in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I really like the idea of, you know, having that the tagline or something, the talking Here points, too. Mike, especially, you know, when you brought up the, you know, we lost the 25%, we're just, you know, that we were cut and the others weren't. If somebody could put together all those talking points list, yeah. for us and, you know, and have that one right thing, in other words, if we get this, we can do this. We can help right. these students and these students we can do our mission, which is to educate the citizens of Northern Nevada for all these great jobs that the governor's economic development has brought in. Otherwise, we're providing full employment for Californians, which is not what we have in mind. Chris, yes. I think in the overall scheme of things, with all of the push to get 
people like Panasonic or whoever, that there would be a lot more recognition of the fact that we don't have enough people here. You know, that there are, they are going to come from somewhere else and that we need to educate our own people. I don't know why that's so hard. Um, actually, the um, GOAD is addressing this. They, they have some very good materials. It's, it's rolling out, especially amongst the manufacturing groups, the pathways um, that they have done a lot of work. And I, maybe at the next meeting, we can look at all these things that are happening. There is an amazing amount that is going on. I'm it's just nobody of, ever knows about it. I'm just thinking more of the educational funding that's yeah, not funding, happening. Yes, I mean, that is what's not they happening. They want all these people to come here and do something, but they're not willing to okay. fund the process. Uh, exactly. Put the people exactly. in the job to do it. That, that is a problem. If I could offer up one comment on that, the, the governor's office of economic development recently gave $175,000 to put people through the training program, the Panasonic program. Um, so we could fund um, upwards of 145 people in that program. The problem is we don't have the people. And we have scholarships set aside for all of our programs and we just don't have the people. Um, but what we're, they're looking at, one of the, the, the tactics is um, trying to get people that are underemployed, that are the residents, into the, the higher level wages and then backfill that. So, but I, I did attend a housing forum recently on the Reno Sparks area and all of this has trickled down if people start migrating into the area because there's not enough places to, for people to live. So that's just one piece yeah. of it, then healthcare, then everything else. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a... Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, well that's everything. I mean. Yes. In the 70s, when this and place I think, exploded, I think we're going to see it. I think we're going to see it all hit, hit some sort of culmination this year because of everything moving in that direction. Good. Any other questions? Just no one word. quick one on the. Uh, you have capacity out of that grant for 175. Sorry, correct. Is that, is that correct? How many? 145. I can mention that at your meeting tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to add? Any questions? You know how to email Kyle if you have any questions. Um, we are looking forward to having everybody help us a little bit, support. It's what we do. Um, at this time, is there any other public comment? Seeing none, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.